everybody, how you doing? Techie101 here, and let me be the first person to welcome you, that's right, you, into the parallel dimension you fell into last night. Woo! That's how we greet people in this dimension. We use ghost sound effects. I don't know if that's how they rock it where you're from, but that's how we do it here. Woo! Yes. Also, you can tell it's a parallel dimension because of the color tie I'm wearing. I'm wearing a blue one instead of a red one, or a green one, or a black one, or whatever color or tie I happen to wear in the dimension you're from. Now, you will be put at ease by the appearance of Barry, because uh, he does not change regardless of what universe he's in, because he is very much a being that is not subjective to the paltry bindings of time and space. No, he exists uh, far beyond and quite above every known reality in existence. Um, Yes, anyway, um, so today there is no One Piece chapter, but just because of that doesn't mean we can't review One Piece chapters, right? Exactly. So today I'm going to be doing a little bit of a special video here. This is a review of a fan chapter that was created by Artor and Professor Gemini. I'm sure many of you are aware of Artor over at the Library of O'Hara. He does those really, really in-depth chapter analysis. He's a chapter analyzer extraordinaire. Also, when the Viva cards were coming out, he helped me out big time because he was the one that translated all of them into English so I can make the videos about them. So big thanks to him. He does the SBSs and all that kind of stuff. Um, and he has a little project over on his website. He's teamed up with One Piece artist extraordinaire, Professor Gemini. You may remember her from such awesome One Piece arts as this one, Kaido and Big Mom in their younger years. And that chapter where Blackbeard attacked Totland. That was a really good one. I also want to do a review of that as well. But this time we're doing a review of the Return to Reverie chapters. That's right. These are going to be uh, six chapters that they're planning. They're only up to two right now. The third installment will be released later this week. Um, and this is, as the title implies, we're going back to Reverie, and this is an imagining of how Artor and Gemini see, like, the second, third, fourth days of Reverie playing out, because we didn't get that in the story. Well, yet, anyway. I guess Oda could always go back in a flashback and show us all of it, but even with that, I don't think we're going to get as much detail here. So, yeah, these are awesome chapters, and they really dive into the myth and the lore of One Piece. Um, I guess I should say at the beginning if, if you're not into that kind of thing because we tackle some major stuff here involving, um, you know, God Valley and the battle between Rocks and Garp and Roger, even if it is just a fan creation, uh, if you're thinking, like, I don't want to even, you know, touch that kind of stuff until Oda touches it, that's understandable, but yeah, that's what we're going to be doing today, and I'm really excited for this, so yeah, big thanks to Artor and Professor Gemini. Their links are in the description below. There's a lot of links in the description below. If I don't reference every single one, I apologize, but they're all down there, so I would suggest just to go check them out there. Um, and just like a regular One Piece chapter, we have a cover page. That's right. One Piece chapter one, Winds of Change, and a cover page done by Ninja Spider. No, wait, no, I misread that. Ninja Spy D -er. Oh, that's that's good. That's good. Their links are also in the description below. But it's awesome. You got Sengoku and you got Garp hanging out on a farm milking goats. I love it! I love it! This is like their retirement, like, you know, when they're like, okay, you know what, we're done with the Marines, we've had enough of this crap. After the series is over with, and the world government is, you know, completely reformed, and the Tenryu Bito get wiped out and everything like that, and finally, at long last, Sengoku and Garp can properly retire, because even though they are retired right now, are they really? You know, because I think they know the situation in the world right now, so they can't exactly step down for good, because they're always going to be needed at this point. But after everything is said and done and resolved and like a new era of peace washes over the world and everything's good they'll be like you know what garp let's uh let's go out and milk goats together yeah sengoku like it we always wanted like we talked about in our younger years yeah let's retire to the goat farm i'm guessing and maybe not fuchsia village but a village that has a windmill all right so that's pretty cool that's art by uh, ninja spy d er okay right but now we get into the actual chapter so we open up at new marine ford in the new world you know the former g1 base here with all the bubbles and the McDonald's arches hanging out, right? And so we uh, touch base with Kobe and Helmeppo. So the last time we saw these guys in the canon of the story, uh, they were helping out King uh, Elizabello II and King Riku Dold III heading to Reverie. You know, they were traveling together and those pirates in a submarine tried to attack them and then Luffy, uh, not Luffy, Kobe and Helmeppo showed up and they stopped them and now they're returning back to base on the second day of Reverie and they're actually going to be meeting with uh, the Marine Promotion Officer, uh, Cancer. Now, Cancer is a character that has appeared 
before. Very briefly, he just kind of appears in the background a lot of time. We don't really focus too much on cancer. Um, very much true to his name, he smokes a bunch of cigarettes, so kind of like smokers, like long lost twin brother, I guess, I don't know. Or maybe it's referencing Cancer the Constellation, which just happens to be a crab. Possibly a giant mechanical crab, but that's just my personal fan theory there. But no, yeah, Cancer is a vice admiral here, and he's also the chief of the Marine Promotion Council. That was something that was added for this, but it makes sense because there has to be somebody in the Marines that's in charge of like, hey, we're going to promote Marines to the next level, okay? Just kind of like how uh, Brand New is sort of like the information officer. He seems to be like the only information operative in the entire Marines because he's uh, Brand New's always the one that's talking about the new bounties being issued. There also has to be someone that's like evaluating waiting like okay you know this marine you know defeated this many pirate ships and he saved these civilians and he participated in this battle and he does some pretty crazy things we're gonna like promote him from captain to uh you know rear admiral or whatever so that's the case right now here where he's talking to kobe and he's like hey kobe you know we've been looking at your papers and your records and you've been really accomplished in the last couple of years since you've joined up keep in mind kobe's only been part of the marines for like I don't know, somewhere between two to three years, maybe two years, like seven months, something like that. And he's already risen to the rank of captain. So he's kind of on the fast track here. He's talking ever since the Rocky Port incident, all the stuff you've done. And you've recently, you know, you just saved two kings heading to Reverie. That's a pretty big deal. The royal family there. Also, that girl, Rebecca, she seems to have a thing for you, buddy. I don't know if you want to go down that road with it, but there it is. Um, they both have pink hair. That's all I need to know, right? There you go. They're perfect for one another. Okay. But anyway, yeah, Cancer's talking about, hey, a, a possible prom promotion is is in your future. You know, just kind of look out. We'll, don't call us, we'll call you. But uh, yeah, look out for it. Then you also have Helmeppo in the background because Helmeppo always tags along with Kobe. And he's like, well, what about me, sir? And uh, Cancer just kind of looks at him and he doesn't say that he has a promotion coming, but he's like, yeah, well, we've reviewed your efforts as well. We've looked at your stuff and the stuff you've accomplished. Um, you know, don't have anything for you right now, but like keep up the good work and you could be promoted eventually. You know, I kind of like that. I really do because a lot of times it's kind of written off like Helmeppo Meppo is a joke. You know, like Kobe is the successful Marine and Helmeppo is just kind of the butt of everyone's jokes way in the back. But Helmeppo, he's been rising through the ranks as well. He's a Lieutenant Commander, which is also a pretty high rank. Um, two below Kobe. It goes Lieutenant Commander, then Commander, then uh, Captain. And then Commodore, then Rear Admiral, right? So, uh, yeah, Kobe's looking like he might get a promotion, but Helmeppo says, well, keep it up, and you might get a promotion as well, you know, but, but not right at this moment, right? Um, I'm wondering if they actually put this in here because of the whole mix-up. It wasn't really a mix-up. It was originally published in the chapter that Kobe was a Rear Admiral uh, when we saw him in between Act 2 and 3 in Wano. He's like, he was a member of S.W.O.R.D., but he was also a Rear Admiral, and then later that was changed in the Tonkoban that he's actually still just a captain. So I'm wondering if that's why they put it in here. But either way, I mean, all the stuff Kobe has done and accomplished over the years, uh, literally just the two something years since he's been a Marine, um, he's already become a captain and all the stuff he's done and he has hockey and everything personally trained by Garp the Fist himself. I can see him reaching the rank of, you know, Commodore or Rear Admiral class pretty quickly, right? And Helmeppo, he's keeping it up as well. He's not quite as powerful and quite as adept as Kobe, but he's definitely rising through the ranks. And he even, you know, talks about this to Kobe himself. He's like, man, I thought I was going to get promoted to the same rank as my father. You know, of course, Captain Morgan was, uh, I think he was a Commodore, actually. No, of course, Captain Morgan was a captain, so Helmeppo, it sets a little personal goal for him, I can imagine, because Helmeppo, the way his dad was and the way he treated him and everything like that, um, if you remember the diary of Kobe Meppo, at one point he even took his own son hostage, so Helmeppo probably doesn't want to have the same rank as his dad because he wants to live up to him because Morgan is pretty much an asshole, but I could see Helmeppo being like, man, I want to prove that I could be a better Marine than him because my dad was so egotistical and, you know, he ruled over that town, Shellstown, and he had like, like, build a giant statue in my image! I am the great Captain Morgan! They named a damn rum after me! Glug, 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 yes! What the hell's that rubber kid do? Poof. Actually, no, it was Zoro that actually cut down Morgan, you know, not Luffy, but, you know, Luffy was present as well. Uh, he kind of kicked everything into process. But no, I could see how Meppo being like, man, I want to be better than that. So I want to achieve the rank of captain as quickly as possible to prove to the other Marines that, like, my family name isn't just a joke or we're not just filled with a bunch of egotistical assholes. You know, I, I could be better than my father. And eventually, probably after he becomes the rank of captain, how Meppo would also, I, I want to be better than my dad. I want to be Commodore. I want to achieve Admiral rank some day. Can Helmeppo do it? Well, I don't know. If he's got the hammer gun, 
he might be able to pull it off. Oh, yeah. But anyway, um, so they talk about that a little bit, and they also mention, he's like, well, the second day of Reverie is kicking off, and uh, there's some interesting stuff going on here that Admiral Fujitora wants to kind of address to the floor of all the kings and everything, and if it does happen, then we're definitely going to have our hands full in the near future, although that is also an essential step for our plans to come to fruition. Yes. I also just love the fact that because this is a fan chapter, I can actually show the images, you know, and actually fold like uh, pages instead of just little tiny squares up here for you know worries of copyright and stuff so that's another main benefit here too but yeah so uh kobe is of course a member of sword and he's mentioning this as an essential step for our plans to come so they're talking about the abolishment of the warlord system that fujitor is going to bring to the floor on the second day of reverie and uh, of course we know now in the story that's actually happened and so for sword that and the, like the founding of the ssg and everything like that that's important to sword's plan um also in implying here that Helmeppo is a member, but I think we can also figure that, considering Helmeppo and Kobe always tag along with each other. It's my opinion that S.W.O.R.D. was started by uh, Sengoku and Garp, and even though Sengoku is semi-retired right now, he still heads it up. He's still the, uh, the, the main officer of that little mini-organization inside of the Marines. Um, kind of clandestine, keep it secret from the majority of the organization, only like the best of the best. But it would still be kind of weird for Kobe to be a member and Helmeppo not to be, because Helmeppo is basically Kobe's second-in-command, and they're always seen together and they're like best friends you know i don't think kobe could really keep that a secret that by the way i'm a member of this secret organization i can't tell Helmeppo, the guy that's always around me you know so i'm sure Helmeppo is a member of sword and he's at least aware of its existence and all that stuff too so uh yeah we're talking about going to reverie but not quite yet we're now going to the red port all right so this is of course the place where you arrive head up in the bondola to marijua the holy land well now we're gonna kind of have a little moment between garp and hina because remember, Hina was the one when after the uh, vice admirals and the marines, after they dropped off all the kings and queens and royalty and they headed up to Marijua, they were kind of just hanging out in a random restaurant at the Red Port, having dinner, like, a job well done, man. And then Hina's off to the side, like, by the way, Garpson, uh, what about uh, the history of rocks? You know, she's the one that first brings up the question, like, what about rocks, Garp? You know, remember, remember that guy that you fought against like 40 years ago or something? And Garp was like, oh, Hina, I don't even know you knew about that. Yeah, that's crazy. That happened years ago. And so Garp doesn't go into a lot of detail there, but he definitely does here. And I love this because if you lived in the One Piece world and you were talking to Garp and he just like, he's like, hey, Garp, what about rocks? He's like, ah, oh, yeah, rocks. He was this incredibly strong pirate. Put Goldie Roger and everybody else to shame. If he were to revive right now, if they got the whole force back into action, man, we wouldn't be do able to do a thing to stop him. The God Valley incident. Well, no, Garp didn't talk about God Valley back then but he talked about how strong rocks was and uh my point is you wouldn't just let that go you wouldn't just be like oh okay and then just walk away no you'd go back up to garp later and you'd be like okay so can you tell me the whole story about rocks and what actually happened because this sounds like a really damn cool story right now that's up to garp whether or not he wants to tell you but you wouldn't just you wouldn't just leave it at that you wouldn't be like ah rocks strongest pirate that ever lived if his crew got back together, they could wipe us all out. Yeah, well, that's that's just how it is. Good thing they're dead. Later, I'm gonna go get a soda. You know, he'd be like, yeah. So Garp is hanging out on his ship uh, at the Red Port, I guess about ready to go back to doing whatever he was doing, you know, protecting the East, you know, whatever Garp does on his day off. And Hina arrives and is like, hey, Garp-san, I have something I wanna ask you. By the way, they nailed the dialogue because Hina always refers to herself in the third person, which I find adorable. <laughs> you know, anyway, so she's like, you know, Hina is curious about uh, what you said earlier if you're willing to talk about it, I'd love to listen. And Garp was like, well, I don't really like to talk about it, and it is top secret confidential marine information, but you already know about it, so yeah, I'll uh, sit down, let me tell you the whole story. <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah, yay, we're getting it finally. Um, and uh, it, it's also important to mention, he brings up that it's like, it's 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 all like so f long ago that people don't even remember it, and God Valley and rocks, they've disappeared in the annals of time, so really, what could it hurt at this point, right? So, and he also has like, how did you even find out about this to begin with? And Hina's like, well, I learned it from Suru, or she's the one that at least gave me the gist of it. And I'm like, all right, that makes sense, because Suru is also, but they all joined up 
together. Garp, Suru, and Sengoku, so it would make sense that she would know about this as well, even if she didn't actually partake in the battle at God Valley, and know, she would still know all about rocks and everything, because he, he was probably the main threat when Sengoku, Garp, and Suru actually joined up with the Marines. Probably like something like, ooh, I don't know, like 60 years ago. Garp is 78, so let's say he joined up when he was like, a, you know, in his 18, like late teens or around there. And it'd be like 60 something years ago. Garp um, could have, you know, joined up because he wanted to deal with the Rocks threat. Rocks could have been at least rising through the rank back then. I mean, that's even further back than the God Valley incident, but there had to be a moment where Rocks started up his operation, terrorized the sea for quite some time, and then 38 years ago at God Valley, that was the moment the crew died out, or at least, you know, ended right there for the Rocks crew. Whitebeard, Kaido, Big Mom, Shiki, they all went their separate ways from that point onward, but they had to raise hell in the sea for quite a while before that. So, a couple of things about Rox we find out. Hina asks him, first question, uh, why did uh, Rox go to God Valley? Why there of all places? And Garp's like, well, I don't know for certain exactly why he went there. From what I can understand, though, you know about God Valley, like what it actually is. God Valley was a place where the Tender Ubito would live. Yes, a lot of them chose to live in Marijua, but a few also like to live there as well. I, I think this makes sense because the Tender Ubito have been around for 800 something years, ever since the Void Century ended. Um, you know, Maybe some of them got tired of living all the way up on top of the red line in Marijua. It's a beautiful city, but maybe some of them wanted to live in another kind of locale. Or, you know, the Tenry Beach, they needed to have like a vacation home or something like that, right? And so there's this beautifully immaculate island, God Valley, and uh, the Emerald City, which is a reference to, um, you know, the Wizard of Oz. You know, not just the movie, but like the books. You know, like the Wonderful Land of Oz, I think, was written in like 1900 uh, by Frank Baum, I think. So a long time ago. You know, that's where that reference comes from. And so that, that also kind of ties into like other mythical cities like El Dorado that exists in One Piece. It's Shandora. So kind of like referencing like these mythical cities. Um, Emerald City, I don't think is really mythical, but still it looks really cool and it's from an old book and that's something that like Oda would definitely take references from. That's been a theory for a while, like when Emerald City might appear. So that's why it's included in this. So um, this was a place where the Tenryubito used to reside aside from Marijua. When they weren't there, they were here. And it was also talked about by someone that Garp mentions, he's like, yeah, I've heard from someone that there's this awesome treasure, this amazingly powerful treasure, also within the depths of God Valley. And Hina's like, wait, awesome treasure, could it be the One Piece? And Garp's like, no, 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 it wasn't the One Piece. From what I hear from this person is that it was the strongest devil fruit to ever exist. And what happened was somehow, Rox fa found out about the existence of this treasure at God Valley, and he knew the national treasure at Marijua, probably the same thing, the secret that um, uh, Doflamingo mentioned when he was in Impel Down. You know, he was just like, I know the secrets, and they're going to be sending people to, like, assassinate me because I know. So Rox found out about the secret of Marijua and this treasure, apparently the strongest devil fruit in existence, in the bowels of God Valley, and he decided that was all he needed, those two things, in order to make his plan uh, come to fruition. Now, what was Rox's plan? All we really got from that so far is he wanted to be king of the world. That's like literally what he said. We'll be kings of the world. We'll rule the world. I mean, it, maybe he was just looking for like, like, this is the strongest devil fruit and this is the ultimate secret of the world government or this is like the ancient weapon technology or something and with those two powers combined, I'm Captain Planet. Oh, yes, I rule over the planet, so I am Captain Planet. Yes, could be something like that. But that was the basic goal for why rocks went to God Valley to begin with, okay? And he is just like, oh, well, wow, this is like some pretty heavy stuff, like ancient treasures, the strongest devil fruit in existence, ancient treasures of Marijua. Are you sure it's okay to talk about this? I mean, I'm invested, definitely, but are you sure this is okay to be talking about this? And Garp is like, yeah, yeah, like I said, it is all confidential information, but um, it happened a long time ago. And God Valley and the treasure and Rox himself, they've all vanished. You know, they're all gone into the annals of history. So what could it hurt at this point, right? I mean, it's one piece after all. There's there's nothing that could happen, like people coming back from the dead. That's just impossible, right? Um, so anyway, yeah, he goes on to include, like, yeah, the, uh, you know, the the reason Rox is declared dead is because after the battle, Rox was immobilized on the island, and then quite literally, like, a giant storm came out of nowhere, like a storm greater than anything, and literally just <sighs> washed over the island, and then... <sighs> it disappeared off the map. Like, that's not an exaggeration. Like, the island just was there, and then the battle happened, and then a giant storm came out of nowhere, like a huge hurricane, like a Cat 7, and just BOOM! 
the, 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 you know, the island was gone the next day. They don't know where it's at, you know, and the treasure's gone and Rox was stuck on the island, so they assume he's gone too. And this happened like, you know, 38 years ago. So of course, you know, maybe like immediately after the island disappears, you'd be like, okay, well, is something gonna happen? Is it gonna come back? But after a year, five years, 10 years, 20 years, almost 40 years, you'd be like, okay, it's gone and it's not coming back. No, Jinbei, why? Jimei's funny because I actually put two thumbtacks on him and he still falls down. Okay, there we go. But now, moving on to the cool part. Um, I mean, this is all really cool stuff, but this is the cool part for me anyway. So, uh, this is a question I had. Like, okay, Roger and Garp team up to go after the Rocks crew, and they have this epic final battle that's like Duel of the Fates level shit, right? Okay, great. Well, you have Rocks, who is already stated to be a biggity badass. You also have Prime Whitebeard, Prime Big Mom, Kaido, maybe a little bit younger than in his prime, but still ridiculously strong, Shiki, Silver Axe, Captain John, Wang Shi! You have all those guys. How the hell is Garp and Roger? I mean, Garp and Roger are wicked strong, but how would they fight against every single one of those heavy hitters? I mean, like, Prime Garp and Prime Roger, awesome, but... That's a lot of people they would be fighting. And they also mentioned that the um, commanders of the Rocks crew were actually referred to as the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse, which is great. I think that, because that's something else, like a reference to mythology that hasn't been quite used yet in One Piece, and I would love to see that be utilized at some point. But yeah, the Four Horsemen. So we got uh, Edward Newgate, Charlotte Linlin, Shiki, and Kaido were these Four Horsemen. And then the other members like Wang Ji and Captain John and, you know, Silver Axe, they were just really heavy hitting members. And then Rocks himself was the captain. So, you know, Hina's like, oh, that's Wow, that's crazy. You got some of the strongest pirates to ever exist on that one crew. And Garp's like, yeah, I know. He's like, well, how the hell did you even win? I mean, even with you and Roger teaming up, he's like, yeah, well, they're too strong for us. It's true. You know, me and Roger teamed up and we fought against uh, rocks, you know, two on one there. And it was still a tough fight. But the person that actually helped us out big time was Whitebeard. Whitebeard decided to stand with us in that particular instance. He'd kind of, you know, his ideology was kind of different from Rox's, which also makes sense when you think about it. If you're going to look at the Rox crew and what they were aiming to accomplish, and Rox seemed like from what we know about him so far, seems kind of like an evil son of a bitch. And Whitebeard doesn't seem that evil, you know? Even if you, this is younger Whitebeard, maybe his ideology is a little bit different from where he was at in his older age. Um, Whitebeard doesn't seem like the kind of guy that's like, I want to rule the world! So it would make sense if there were any members of Rox's crew that were going to decide to be like, stand against Rox and be like, I can't follow you anymore, Captain, and kind of like turn traitor, it would be Whitebeard. And in this uh, explanation, it was. Whitebeard in his prime, with his mighty flowing blonde hair and his bisento stood before Charlotte Linlin, Kaido, and Shiki and he fought those guys off while Roger and Garp were brawling with rocks in the background. Good lord! You get a double page spread that looks incredible! Um, you know what? I can't wait to see this whole battle. Like, this fight is gonna be ridiculous when we finally get to it, both in the actual manga and in the anime and any other alliteration that might pop up from this battle at some point. It's gonna be absolutely insane. I mean, like, this is literally, like, the strongest pirates and the characters that have ever existed in this story pretty much all in one place. I mean, at this time period, like, 40 years ago. So, like, Dragon wouldn't have been alive back then. But it's like... Well, Dragon, yeah. Dragon 38 years ago. Dragon's 55, so he would have been, like... So, 17. Yeah. That's weird. 38 years ago, he was 17. Yeah. That's, that's right. Okay, it just, that doesn't seem right to me. That's, that's accurate, but that doesn't seem right to me. That sounds like he should be way younger than that at that age, um, at this point. But okay, whatever. I mean, who's to say? I don't know math. Anyway, um, awesome double page spread, right? And then that's kind of how we leave that off there, uh, with rocks being defeated and like we see his hand and like sinking below the waves. And then Hina is just like, oh God, that is, that was such an epic story. The way you described it was so vivid. I am, Hina is so lightheaded right now. And then Garp just kind of laughs and just like, ha ha ha, yeah, pretty crazy story, right? Yeah, it's insane. But the last question that Hina asks him is, uh, but one, one thing, one thing before I pass out in sheer epicness. <sighs> Why did you protect the Celestial Dragons? You know, I don't think, you know, you don't, you don't like them very much, right? So why did you choose to protect them? And then that's when Garp is says, well, that's because my son was among them. And then we end that scene. I'm like, ah! So, um, 
There's a lot of theories regarding, you know, Dragon and Dragon's wife, who would be Luffy's mom in the story there. Um, the theory that I like to go with is that Luffy's mom was the one that was a celestial dragon. And then uh, Dragon kind of met her and they fell in like a forbidding kind of love and Luffy was eventually born. Maybe something happened with um, Luffy's mom. She died or she was executed by the Tenryubito and that's why Dragon decided, you know, I'm going to lead a revolutionary and I'm going to change this world. That makes sense to me. So... I mean, maybe you could be taken from the sense like Dragon was literally a celestial dragon, but then in that sense, it's like Garp had to also be part of that lineage. Um, unless, I guess, Garp's wife could have also been the celestial, because this could have still worked at just knocking it up a generation. So instead of Dragon's wife being the celestial dragon, maybe Garp's wife was the celestial dragon, and then Dragon was born, and then the same basic thing continued. Or it could mean that Dragon was among them, not literally part of the Tenryubito, but just he was part of it. He was present on the island, that's why he went to help. Could be that situation too, where he was married to him, so technically it would be Garp's child, but not his child by birth, but like by law, if that's the situation. Okay, so yeah, awesome, awesome. But anyway, that's that's the Garp scene of the chapter. Now we cut over to the shores of the Red Line, where we see uh, Shanks. We touch base with him and see what's going on with Shanks. So Shanks has just finished his meeting with the Gorosei, and so he arrives back down on the Red Force, and you got Lucky Roo and Ben Beckman and everybody there, and they're just like, so how'd it go, Captain? How'd it go? And the meeting with the Ten with the Ten Rubito, but the Gorosei, how'd it go? And and uh, Shanks is like, well, uh, I was able to talk to them, so at least I made it that far. They didn't just shoo me out. They did listen to me, but they're not going to take any action uh, because they're so worried about other stuff going on right now with Reverie and also the other two, Yonko, you know, Kaido and Big Mom are also forming an alliance. We talked about that. They're really hesitant to kind of get involved with any of that right now. And so uh, looks like we're going to have to take on Blackbeard ourselves, boys. Let's move out! You know, so that's the end of that little moment with Shanks. And, I mean, I think everybody kind of figured the reason why Shanks was talking to the Gorosei. He mentions, I gotta talk about a certain pirate. He was talking about Blackbeard, because Shanks, more than anybody, knows how threatening Blackbeard is. Whole thing that happened at Marine Ford two years ago with Whitebeard. You'd think that Shanks, at some point, would be like, alright, listen, I I I'm gonna talk to our enemies, you know, because I can't do this. Maybe I mean, maybe Shanks could do it by himself, but it would definitely help to have, like, more people helping him. So Shanks decided, you know what, I'm gonna talk to the world government, I'm gonna see if they're gonna help me out with this at all. And later it down and say, hey, listen, Blackbeard, you do not understand how big of a threat this guy is. This guy literally could be a darkness that destroys the entire world. I am not lying about that. I'm not exaggerating. He could literally do that. I need your help with this. And the Gorosei are just like, well, you know, we know he's a threat, but guess we can't do anything else. So they're not doing anything right now. Honestly, I think the Gorosei in this situation are just going to be waiting and seeing if the alliance between Kaido and Big Mom, that might collapse on its own. Uh, it might be rather dangerous, but to just leave it as it is. But for all they know, they might be thinking that Kaido and Big Mom would like attack and destroy each other. And that would be a big benefit for the Gorosei, plus what's going on in Wano right now. It's like, well, let's just leave everything as it is right now. After the whole events at Wano is over, maybe the Yonko will be defeating themselves. Who knows? You know, or some other pirates might. And that'll be more power for the world government. So that's a theory that I have. Maybe that's what they're waiting for. They're not making a lot of moment here. But um, yeah, Shanks is just like, you know, I insisted, but they're just not listening to me. So I guess we're on our own for this one. Uh, Lucky Roo also brings up, what about like Luffy? You know, cause Luffy was also on the heel, you know, like Kaido and Big Mom are also attacking him right now in Wano. He's dealing with all that stuff. Shouldn't we go help him? And Shanks is just like, well, you know, I, I, I promised Luffy to not, you know, see him again until he becomes a great pirate and he gives the hat back to me. Like, that's a promise we cannot, like, even if the world ends, we can't go back on that. That's a promise that's going to be until the day that actually arrives. But he's like, I think, don't, don't underestimate Luffy. I think Luffy will be okay. He's got a lot of strong friends helping him out. I think he'll manage to get his, uh, get, get out of this situation. He'll be okay. So that's Shanks. And the last scene there is an awesome spread there of Blackbeard and Shanks on like a dual page. And they're like, you know, we must stop him to put an end to Rox's legacy. Get ready to set sail, man and we're going after Blackbeard. A lot of people figure that, yeah, Blackbeard is either related to Rox or the reincarnation of Rox, or if not blood related to him, um, you know, like Luffy embodies the spirit of Roger, Blackbeard or Marshall D. Teach embodies the spirit of Rox. So that's the general premise from that theory there. I've made a bunch of videos about that. So now we go to the last scene of the chapter here where we cut up to the red line at Marie Joie. We don't quite go back to the reverie table itself yet. We just see a bunch of crows, you know, cawing all around Eden City. Eden City is the residential district of uh, Marie Joie, Eden, the Garden of Eden. A lot of references to like biblical, you know, um, you know, like the, like Genesis and like Adam and Eve. And like also we have like the tree of Eve and stuff in, in one piece. So this makes sense. It would be called that. 
So we have Eden City, which is the residential district, probably the place where not like, you know, the Tenryubito live there, and I'm, I'm sure the servants, maybe some of them live with the Tenryubito, like their closest servants, but probably like the guards of the city and other people that aren't directly involved with the Tenryubito, they live in this residential district, okay? Um, yeah. And so they're noticing there's a bunch of crows calling around, the guards are, and they're like, wow, there's a lot of crows. In fact, man, I've never seen these many crows or... Actually, have you seen any crows in the Holy Land, like, ever? I'm like, no, I don't think I have, actually. You know, they flew up this high. I'm like, eh, crows are kind of a sign of an omen, isn't that? That's not good. Yeah, okay, well, whatever. So they're flocking around all over the place. Of course, the crows are, in fact, Karasu, the, one of the commanders, the northern commander of the Revolutionary Army. So we cut down to uh, the Revolutionary Army's little hidey hole that Morley created. You see Sabo down there, and Karasu meets with him, and he's just like, you know, Sabo, I'm back. And he's like, oh, what did you learn? And he's like, well, I didn't learn any, there's no trouble going on per se, but I did find someone that would be proven to be quite helpful in our little uh, cause here. And so they have a plan that's going to be set up here. That's actually going to be in the second chapter. Um, I've already read the second chapter of this, uh, and the third chapter, as I said, is coming out later this week, but there's going to be six in total from what Artor has told me. So that that's setting up for the next chapter, and then we finally cut over to uh, Castle Pangea. The second day of Reverie has now concluded. They get let out of the meeting room. Uh, Neptune meets back up with Shirahoshi, and they talk about, like, the, uh, they, they were going to bring up at Reverie, like, what about relocating Fishman Island to the surface? That was Otohime's wish this entire time. And so uh, Neptune says, he's like, well, uh, they decided to reschedule that to the fourth day, uh, but we will still talk about it. You know, we had some other issues to deal with today uh, that are probably also going to change the world. But yeah, we're going to move on, on to that there. So we'll see what comes of that. But uh, let's see if there's anything else here. More importantly, you know, uh, we just have to wait patiently. And then, yeah, they mention like, hey, uh, is it just me or is the wind picking up? We also see get to see Dalton there off to the side and they're just talking on the rooftop. And they're like, man, the wind is really picking up around here. And then last page, we get to see a bunch of the very uh, indicative of the scene when Shanks arrived on the Moby Dick. Uh, all of the guards at Pangea Castle are passing the hell out as Dragon, Monkey D Dragon, rocks toward the front door of the damn castle. The front door. That takes balls, man. But that is a dragon thing to do. Dragon don't take the back door. Dragon does not sneak in through the basement. Dragon does not throw a grappling hook and, you know, go through the second floor bathroom. No. Dragon shows up to your damn castle. He's walking in the front damn door. All right? And no one's going to stop him, right? So, yeah, Dragon's walking forward. He's like, it's time for a revolution. Now, something I should bring up at this point is, and I've talked to Artor about this and everything in preparation for this video, you know, they really painstakingly took everything in this chapter in accordance with the canon that we've been presented in One Piece so far. So, for example, like Dragon is here at Marijoie, but Dragon also appeared, uh, remember he appeared last time we saw Dragon, he was at Kamabaka, and they were talking to like Ivankov and everybody, that's when like Sabo and everybody were ready to leave. Sabo haven't, hasn't even left yet during that chapter, that was the last time we saw Dragon. So, you know, they I guess left at the same time and they arrived here to like, you know, stay with the continuity, so that's like, they actually planned all that ahead of time, okay? Um, obviously you can't plan ahead for like stuff that would happen in the chapters that haven't been released yet, but from so far in the story, that's all we got. And keep in mind, Reverie, Reverie has already concluded in the current storyline of One Piece. Like, when the raid on Onigashima is going on, Reverie ended already, you know? This is, like, this is going back in time a little bit here. But yeah, Dragon arrives, given the fact that he probably has the ability of the Storm Storm Fruit or some kind of wind-based fruit or wind logia, I don't know what he has, really, but something that can affect the weather. I don't think uh, fast traveling to the Grand to the Grand Line or to the Blues or to even the Red Line in Marijoie would really be all that difficult for him. If he could literally, like, turn into wind or something like that or control wind, you you know, he could just literally get in whatever ship and just, pfft, okay, I'm here at the bottom of the red line, pfft, super dragon, and just, oh, he just said, dragon fly, that's the name of the technique, dragon fly, he just takes his cape and just, pfft, like a reverse parachute, and just pfft, all the way up to the top of the red line, he could do it, he's dragon, you say he can't? Whew, so, uh, yeah, that was a chapter, wasn't it? I loved it. I think it flowed perfectly with the One Piece story, uh, getting really involved in the lore. And, you know, the funny thing is, like, in the continuity of One Piece, it's possible that Hina could have went to, like, Garp and talked to him after the events of that meeting 
It's just that we, the readers, never heard about it, right? Because Oda is like, hey, I got to make a story. I can't reveal everything immediately, but the characters might know about this, you know? So what is stopping Hina from after everyone left to go up to Garp and be like, hey, Garp, can you tell me a little bit more about rocks? And Garp would be like, sure, what do you want to know? It's just that we, the readers, wouldn't know about it. So this is kind of depicting, like, if there was no filter, if there was no barrier between, like, writer and, like, oh, I can't let the fans know about this yet, uh, what would it be like? So that's pretty cool. Now, obviously, Artor and Gemini did this, you know, great, uh, you know, for uh, Gemini, the artwork was amazing as always, but uh, I want to go through all the credits here just to make sure that I don't forget anybody, don't leave anybody out here. So we got writer, editor, producer, extraordinaire, Artor, Library of O'Hara, link below. Then we got Gemini, artist, designer, uh, and then we got a guest cover page artist, Ninja Spy D -er. uh, That is, uh, they change out the cover page artist every chapter, so that's like a new artist each time, so that's pretty cool. Then we got some other credits here. We got uh, feedback from Robin Joy Boy from Joy Boy Theories, O'Hara, and Mr. Morge. Pretty awesome. Then we got proofreading and quality control from Fiso and Lady T. Typesetting done by Jack. Yes, Jack. That Jack, yes. And then we got moral support from Ninja Spy D -er and Agent 65. Anybody that uh, has been doing like uh, any sort of creative project on the internet, you know, whether it be Reddit or DeviantArt or YouTube or whatever you do, uh, any kind of like long term project, it's good to have moral support. It definitely helps. <laughs> yes, uh, morally support. You gotta have morally support. Yes, okay. So uh, that's the first chapter of Return to Reverie. I loved it. If you wanna check it out, like I said, link is found below to the actual chapter itself and to everybody else that I mentioned in this video. Links are all found below. Um, I'll be continuing this at some point. I don't know when, but I'll be doing the second chapter of Reverie and I'll be continuing this little thing here. I don't know what's going to be up with the One Piece chapters because of the state of the world. Um, just, I wouldn't be surprised if Shueisha came out and said, hey, we're going to, you know, postpone Shonen Jump for like a week or maybe two weeks or longer because of the events that are going on in the world. That could very well happen. In which case that gives me opportunities to talk about these instead so we still have something to work with i think um i'm pretty sure ohara and gemini uh they started work on this you know before all this crap happened but it actually worked out great because now it's like okay even on the weeks where one piece doesn't happen or there's problems with uh you know shonen jump coming out because of the situation in the world uh we still have these fan chapters so i really love them and uh look forward to talking about them in the future thanks for watching everybody teching signing out Woo! That's also how we say goodbye. Woo!